Good morning and welcome to Deerfield United Methodist Church. And we are so glad that you are worshiping with us today in our online service. We are a church that is committed to loving Jesus and loving others. My name is Joanna Besky and I'm the pastor here. And this morning as we begin, we have a few of a few announcements. The first is that we want to honor all of our graduates from this past year as well as 2020. If someone in your family or you yourself has graduated these last two years, please contact the church office either today and leave a message or tomorrow so that on June 13th in our outdoor service, we can honor and celebrate with you. Another announcement is that we are partnering with one of our missions, Cornerstone Women's Resource Center, in their annual baby bottle fundraiser. Baby bottles are available in the church office, and the idea is that you take this bottle and you're filling it with your loose change, with, with cash, with checks made out to the Cornerstone Women's Resource Center, and on Father's Day, June 20th, we'll be collecting those and turning them in to the mission for their work among women. Our final announcement is our birthdays and anniversaries. This week on uh, May 19th is Rachel Trout's birthday. Next Saturday, the 22nd, is my birthday. The 17th is the Warburton's, Teresa and Jeremy's anniversary, and Sharon and Will Trout will be celebrating their birthday on Friday, May 21st. So please pray for uh, these individuals and wish them a happy birthday or a happy anniversary. I ask you to join us now in the singing of All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. The power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord. seed of Israel's race, ye ransom from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord. Let us this morning declare together our faith through the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He is ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Our scriptures for today are being read by Sue Soyring. Our Old Testament lesson today is from Psalm chapter 93, verses 1 through 5. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Indeed, the world is established, firm, and secure. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up the Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Mightier than the thunder of the great waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Your statues, Lord, stand firm. Holiest and adorns your house for endless days. Here ends the Old Testament reading. Our New Testament is from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud lifted, a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Here ends our New Testament reading. Thanks be to God. What is the message of ascension? Well, it's simple and powerful. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. We sometimes think of Ascension Day as the day that Jesus left the earth. One minute he was with the disciples, and the next minute a cloud took him out of their sight, and he was gone. When you think about the Ascension, considering God's mission to seek and save the lost, Jesus is leaving doesn't seem to make much sense. The disciples themselves were a bit confused as they stood there looking up at the clouds. Jesus left, though, so that his mission could continue. His ascension means that the mission is no longer limited to where he was physically present. But with the risen Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father, it means that he is spiritually present everywhere, not just Lord and Savior in Jerusalem, but where he was as he was speaking to them. But he is now Lord over Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. God the Father raised Jesus the Son from the dead, giving him the name above every other name, so that the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue confess 
that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. And in ascending, he sends God's Spirit to fill and empower God's people to be his witnesses, completing the task until the very ends of the earth. Jesus ascended knowing that it was the best thing for the continuing of the mission. He knew that when he left, God would send his spirit and there wouldn't be just one person with the power and the message of Christ, but many. Ascension Day tells us that Jesus returned to the Father and as we just declared in the Apostles' Creed, he is seated at the right hand of the Father. This is no ordinary seat. We read in Revelation 3 that Jesus conquered and then sat down with his father on the throne. He conquered by dying and rising. He conquered sin and death. And because of this, we know that one day this endless battle between good and evil, sin and death is going to end because Jesus Christ is Lord of all. And one day his lordship will be revealed to all. One day, all that we all will have the opportunity to hear and respond to the good news. On that day, the last word will go to the one who taught us the way of love and compassion, the one who loved us and gave his life for us, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This gives us hope for the future, and it also gives us strength for the present as we choose to be faithful to the way of life that he taught us. This is the message of hope that we are called to declare. And this passage makes clear our role in God's plan. The passage tells us that we are God's witnesses, that we are Jesus's witnesses. So how is Jesus's kingdom message spread? Well, the apostles had a plan for this. In verse six, we read, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time that you will restore the kingdom of Israel? Not the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Israel. In other words, they were saying, Lord, if you will just make Israel into a superpower, then our armies will be able to enforce your authority everywhere. And we can understand this perspective, can't we? If you're going to fight evil and tyranny, you need a powerful army to do it. That's been the default way of changing the world since Cain and Abel. But our reading from Acts tells us that Jesus had a different plan to change the world. His plan was to use God's people filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, just look at verse 8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit come comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses. This was Jesus' simple plan. When on earth, he called his disciples and he takes them out on mission with him. He trains them in this new way of life in the kingdom of God. And then he sends them out to tell other people what they have seen and heard. It's a simple and sustainable plan and it has worked for generations, but it requires God's people. Filled by his spirit, submitted and obedient to his plan. We see this example in Mark's gospel when Jesus starts calling people to follow him. He calls Simon and Andrew. They were fishing. It was their occupation. And he says, follow me. But Jesus' call and command don't end with simply following him. What comes next? Jesus says, follow me and I will make you fishers of people. You see, fishing for people wasn't an added extra. It was the purpose of discipleship. We become Christians. We're trained in the art of following Jesus for the very purpose that we can pass it on to others. This isn't a luxury or a specialized task for a select group of individuals like pastors, missionaries, or evangelists. It's the call of every disciple of Jesus. This was part of the message I was sharing over these last two weeks in Senegal as I met with Christian women. The community of faith is just starting to grow there, and it would be easy for them to think, well, it's the job of the pastor or the missionary, but that's not what Jesus taught. 
few weeks ago, we looked at the Great Commission. And Jesus told his disciples to go and make disciples of all people. It'll take all people to reach all people. We are the ones who are supposed to be following in Christ's way, doing what he did and teaching what he taught when he walked this earth. This is the very purpose for which the church exists. If we're not doing this, we're not doing the thing Jesus had in mind when he called us to follow him in the first place. This is how the kingdom of God spreads through the work of faithful witnesses like you and me. In addition, the work of passing it on to others, it doesn't wait until we are fully mature or feel like our training is complete. The training takes place as Jesus is spreading the message to others. He takes the disciples along with him, and while they are doing the work with him, he trains them to follow him. In the Gospels, we see that you don't grow as a disciple of Jesus by sitting and listening to sermons. You grow by going along with Jesus as he lives and sharing God's love with others. And that is still true today. The minute we come into a personal and saving relationship with Jesus is the minute we become his witnesses. Discipleship includes joining him in the work of spreading the message. So what do disciples do? What do witnesses do? They share the story of what they have experienced. Witnesses for Jesus tell others what they know about him, the things that are real to them, the good news about him that they have experienced in their daily lives. One of the first recorded Christian witnesses in the New Testament is Andrew. Andrew used to come and listen to John the Baptist. And one day Jesus passes by and John points him out saying, look, behold, there is the Lamb of God. Andrew heard him say this and he took off after Jesus. And here's what happened next. When Jesus turned and saw him following, he said to him, what are you looking for? They said, Rabbi, where are you staying? He said, come and see. And they came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. After spending the day with Jesus, the first thing Andrew did was to go and find his brother, Simon Peter. And he told him, we have found the Messiah. And he brought Simon to Jesus. So Andrew gets to spend the day with Jesus. And he's so excited about Jesus that he immediately goes and finds someone he loves, his brother, Simon. And he tells him about it. And it's so persuasive that his brother's curiosity is aroused. And so he goes to meet Jesus too. And the rest, as they say, is history. On the day of Pentecost, which we're going to look at next week, Peter preaches a powerful sermon and 3,000 people become Christians. Andrew, on the other hand, didn't preach a sermon. He was just a faithful witness. And the result that was what was that one person, his brother, became a Christian. But the sermon that Peter preached would never have been preached without that one word of witness. At the end of the Gospel of Matthew, the author writes that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. The whole world, all nations. That is God's desire that every person in every nation hears the good news of Jesus Christ. In our passage today, Jesus speaking to the disciples expands on that, saying in Jerusalem, where they were, where he was speaking, in Judea, which was the region south of Jerusalem, and in Samaria, the region north of Jerusalem, and the ends of the earth, being all the world beyond that. For us today, we could read it this way, you will be my witnesses in your Jerusalem, your family or your city, your Judea and Samaria, your state, your country, and the ends of the earth, all nations. It's not sequential. It doesn't say uh, here and then there and then over there. No, it says and. It's here and there and everywhere. In addition, it's a call to all believers who are scattered all over the globe. And so it might look like one of those maps that show the flight patterns and the planes are coming and going from everywhere to everywhere. Last week when I was teaching at the women's retreat, 
in Senegal, I was with, with I was with almost 30 women who love Jesus. And in that group were women from Senegal, from the northern, central, and southern part of the country, representing at least three different people groups. In addition, there were women from six other countries present, one of those being the U.S., but the other five countries were other African nations, women called by God to come to Senegal to reach the Senegalese there. God is calling and using people from everywhere to everywhere. Um, excuse me. Among the top missionary sending nations, countries by percentage of the population, besides the U.S., are places like Brazil, South Korea, and Palestine. That's just amazing. And in, and in addition to God sending people from all nations to other nations to accomplish his task, he's moving people around. God is bringing people in need of Jesus from places where they would otherwise not hear the gospel or have a very small percentage of chance to hear the gospel into places where there is freedom of expression, where the gospel is being openly shared. Just think of the numbers of university international students coming to the U.S. and other developing countries. Many of these students who become Christians while at university are going back to their home countries where the gospel is restricted and where so few even know our Lord. A couple of weeks ago, as I was trying to get to Senegal and had a few hiccups, I found myself in wait. I found myself waiting in line uh, at a COVID testing center in New York City, just outside the airport. While waiting, I struck up a conversation with several people around me. Each time, I was asked where I was traveling and why. And it was a perfect opportunity for me to talk about Jesus. In line with me was a mother and son from Ireland, a couple from Jamaica, a family returning to India, and several in individuals from various Latin American countries. Just think about the people that you meet regularly. For some, we must go to the ends of the earth to fulfill this calling. For others, God is bringing the ends of the earth to us. So what does it look like to be his witnesses? It means acknowledging the good news about Jesus that we experience and sharing that with others. What's your story? How have you seen God's hand at work in your life recently? What are some of the things that you're praying about and how are you seeing him answer prayer? What are you learning in God's word? These are all parts of our testimony to others. If you're not sure what to share, ask God to show you and to give you the opportunities to acknowledge him in the day-to-day -day of your life. That is a prayer I know he loves to answer. One important thing to remember is the role of the Holy Spirit in our witnessing. Acts 1.8 begins by saying, You will receive power when my Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. We'll talk more about the empowering work of the Holy Spirit and completing God's mission next week. But we need to remember it's the Holy Spirit who gives us these opportunities and who fills our mouth with the words to speak. It's also the Holy Spirit who prepares people's hearts and convicts, convicts them of sin and their need for Christ. Having said that, I want to end by giving some practical examples of how we can be his witnesses. One is to simply pray for people. Make a list of the names of people you want to share Christ with and begin praying for them. Ask God to show you how and what to pray for them, not just for their salvation, but for him to reveal to you specific needs that they may have and pray. And then when they share with you about something that happens, you might even be able to, to say, hey, I was just praying that for you. And it could be a doorway to the gospel. So pray for people. If you're ready to be a little bit more bold, pray with people. When someone shares something with us, what if we could ask, can we pray for that? I've, I often tell people that I believe God answers prayers and I would be honored to ask him on your behalf. 
If they say, no, I don't believe in God or prayer, I say, that's okay, I do, and I will pray for you. If they say yes, then sometimes I pray right then and there for them. And most of these people don't know that I'm a missionary or I've been a missionary or that I'm a pastor. I remember praying for a woman who was having infertility issues and several months later she became pregnant. She came to me and wanted to know more about the God that I had prayed for, prayed to on her behalf. Share what you're learning. A simple question like how is your weekend or how's it going can be an opening to whatever God is doing in your life. Sharing how prayer and God's peace has gotten you through a situation can open conversations as people begin to see how you trust God and how your faith is integrated into your life and not just an event that happens on a Sunday morning. Now, we all have unique opportunities and we're all different, but here's some ways that I found that God has used to share about him in my own life. One of those has to do with Bible quotes. People quote the Bible all the time without knowing the source of their quote or what it means. Have you ever heard someone say something that has its origin in the Bible? Here's some examples. Let there be light, forbidden fruit, an eye for an eye, man does not live on bread alone, or even a man after my own heart. I love asking people if they know that the phrase that they just said comes from scripture and if they know its original meaning. In Senegal, my version of this has to do with t-shirts. Secondhand clothes end up all over the world. And so it's very common to see someone wearing a shirt with a spiritual reference and ask them if they, I'll walk up to them and ask them if they know what it says. English is not spoken in Senegal. And so most often they'll say, no, I don't. And so I'll tell them. One day I saw a man in the fabric market wearing a t-shirt that on the front said, see you at the pole. And on the back was the scripture, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. I mentioned how it was a movement of students praying at their schools. And this led to a whole conversation about the importance of prayer and the need to pray for forgiveness of sins and pray for God's healing on our nations. As unique as we all are, God has unique ways that he is using and will use us. Let's ask God to show what that looks like for you and for me. Let us be faithful both as individuals and as a church to obey his commandment to make disciples of all nations until he comes again. Amen. We want to be praying for you. And so I invite you to click on the link in the description of this video for our digital prayer card, or you can call the church office and share a prayer request and know that we will be praying for you. Our tithes and offerings are also able to be taken by the church website. The address is, is also listed above and there is a section for donation where you can give online or checks can be mailed to the church office address. Let's take a minute now as we, be, as we prepare to end this service in prayer. Heavenly Father, you have called us to yourself and you have called us to bring others with us in this journey of faith towards you. It is your desire that none should perish, but all have eternal life. And so, Lord, we ask that you would empower us to be your witnesses, that you would give us opportunities, that you would give us the words to speak, Lord, to make your name known in our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, until all have heard. Let us go forth as his witnesses in his power to see his kingdom come. Amen.